This is Anya Leonard, founder of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today's episode is with Ben Potter, a resident classicist and regular author at classicalwisdom.com. But before we get started, a quick reminder that this podcast is made possible by Classical Wisdom members. To find out more about our Classical Wisdom Society, please go to classicalwisdom.com and click Start Here. How is the Odyssey relevant today? Okay, so how is the Odyssey relevant today? So, just throw you right in the deep end, right? (laughs) This is a question. This is, if you go to any sort of um, uh, A-level exam paper, which is A-levels are the exams we take in the UK just before university, you'll probably get this question on a classics paper. How is the Odyssey relevant today? And, well, you can, like all good essays, you can answer it any way you want. You just say, well, of course it's not. But it's, the thing about the Odyssey is, it's about, it's about the striving for something. It's about the homecoming of a distance, the nostos, the, the trying to get himself back to the thing he wants to, to, to get back to, not just to achieve a goal, which would be a good enough um, way to make it relevant to today's, to, to, you know, to be alongside all those uh, crummy books in the self-help section of how to achieve your goals in, in 20 easy years and one Trojan war. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would about, just, that'd be a top seller for sure. Yeah. Top seller, of course. Yeah. That's, Cause that's what people want. A long, arduous, way to, to achieve their goals but, it's about it, thousands of years for a reason <laughs> yeah well it's it's about it's this message of achieving your goals it's not that easy it's so so i, I totally completely the wrong thing it definitely shouldn't be in the in the self-help section because they're all to you know get slim in three weeks and quit smoking in five days and do this and do that and it's saying that Achieving things, achieving what you want in life as a human is a long, arduous journey. And it's full of pitfalls and terrors and scary nights. And, you know, the the metaphorical monsters in the dark. And you have to overcome these things. And at the end of it, the the goal, the the what you win is not is not gold and it's not uh, riches, it's, it's your family back. So that is one very romantic way you could look at the Odyssey. I have just realized that Finding Nemo is basically like the Odyssey. <laughs> just, keep you, if, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. This is how you understand the classics in the ancient world if you've got like a five-year-old. You're like, it all relates to Finding Nemo, yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's so many of the these stories. They they, they map onto um, the the Lion King is is Hamlet. Is I, I never thought about that until somebody pointed out to me. But the Lion King is Hamlet. Wow. It's the dead father comes back as a ghost, tells you your destiny. You come back. You take. But I mean, it, the only difference is not everybody kills himself at the end. But up until the final scene, the Lion King is Hamlet. So they they echo, there's a reason these stories endure, even if. You change the format a little bit. This is my, very mind blowing. <laughs> I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I mean, it's 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 relevant for yeah for this for this coming back to your family to 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 to, to achievement through strife through endurance. I mean, it's relevant just just. I, I I always get a bit thrown when I get asked questions about how does this relate to to the modern world and this and this and I just think. For me, a good story is a good story. I, I don't I don't need a reason to, to bring it forward to the modern world, especially. I think, I think, yeah, you know, I think that's an excellent point because I just was rereading uh, the Odyssey recently and I was reading the Emily Wilson translation, which I think is fantastic. And it does a very good job of making it probably more accessible by using very modern language. Um, mm-hmm. And so you're not distracted maybe by the language. You can really get into the, the plot and the rhythm and you can see the descriptions still for what they are um, and the powerful imagery, but that the actual 
words are you know very uh, easy to understand and I had forgotten just how suspenseful it is at times. Like, mm. Usually, even though I know the whole story so well, I'm still like kind of on the edge of my seat. Like, oh, when are they going to find out this is actually Odysseus? You know, you really get into yeah. it. Yeah, you do get sucked in, and it's. And I haven't got around to to to, to Wilson's translation, but it's 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 the hot thing. So it's it's I should definitely get myself updated on the Odyssey. Oh, um, you you will love it. You seriously, it's. Um, it's so enjoyable, like immediately. Mm. So yeah, good. So there we go. That's 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 what that's what I'm going to get myself for my birthday. <laughs> but but the, yeah, but there's all these there's all these the, the great thing about it, as there is with so many great pieces of literature, there's all these little subplots and sub themes as well. So you've got the broad theme of coming back home, striving hard to come back home, persevering, enduring, suffering the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, and finally getting home and reuniting with the people you love, and that being the most important thing that there is. But then if, you're, if, you're, if you were looking at it and you were thinking about it as a sort of more deterministic philosophical person, you, you talk, you'd look at how Odysseus is just battered to and fro by the whims of capricious gods and almost always nearly being killed by this god and being sometimes literally pulled out of the water by this god. And at every turn, you realize this, one of the reasons he's a great hero is because gods love him. So it's, it's absolutely, it's, we always think about the Greek heroes and we've got this sort of image in our mind of they're all sort of fantastic and strong and shining and smart. But the reason for their brilliance is always the favor of the gods. It's always, we are, we are the stars tennis balls, aren't we? So it's, it's, we don't really have, we don't, we don't really have that much say in what we do. We should, we should be humble in the face of, of, of the good and the bad that, that comes to us in our life. And there's thousands of little subplots like this in, in the Odyssey. The hospitality we've, we've talked about in the magazine so much over the years of the Xenia theme of the Odyssey, of being a good host, being a good guest. Um, and I think Xenia, like, I really, I love the concepts of Xenia and it's, it's interesting, again, when rereading it to see just how prominent it is with regards to like a set of social rules and expectations on how to interact with each other and how to interact with people we don't know. And mm. I think there is something really valuable and seeing that there's sort of an ancient system for handling otherness with yeah. humanity and civility and being like, okay, here is a stranger who's washed up on shore, who's starving and hungry and dirty. Like, how do you treat them? And I think it's interesting because you might say, like modern Christians would say, well, that's, you know, the teachings of Jesus says, you know, mm -hmm. to take in this, this poor and the sick. And, and it's weird when you're reading it and it's, it's Zeus is the God of the needy and the, yeah. <laughs> help the, the, the poor and and so you're like wow you know it's 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 our, our arrogant angry vengeful zeus is the is the is the bernardos of of all this is the man trying to help the poor it's and, and the needy it's well you know the greek, a... the greek gods weren't so uh two-dimensional i think than we like to mm, see them yeah. like we, we like to see them as like superhero characters you know like batman he's all good or you know the joker he's all bad or something but you know nowadays we, we're delving into those characters differently as well but um mm. the greek gods they could both be heroes and villains you know well, I, I remember i remember seeing an interview with stephen fry when he was doing his mythos tour when he, he did a, a rewriting a lot of a lot of the greek myths and he was talking about this is why although he's a prominent atheist this is why he always felt more affinity to the greek gods he said because they're human because if you gave humans that power yeah they might do a few nice things here and there but then when they're angry they would be so terrible and so vengeful and so awful so i mean we've seen how humans can behave when they 
they don't really have any power. So if you give them supernatural, superhuman strength and, and, and ability, they'll, they'll probably be superhumanly good and superhumanly bad. But then I guess, so it's interesting that there's still this cultural expectation of the humans to behave better than the gods. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's it. It's, um, and this, this crops up in, in, in Euripides as well quite a lot. I don't want to talk about Euripides today, but it's, is that, and, and uh, this is what Socrates says uh, when he's going on trial, according to Plato, is that we, the, the Athenians of the fifth century are saying, yeah, yeah, we can't take these gods seriously. It's like, you know, if we behave like that, we would never get away with it. That's, this is not fair. This is ridiculous. And, the, and they're beginning to see that you might have to shave the edge off a few of these gods in terms of, of behavior. But, but yeah, I mean, but it's, um, it's, it, it feels very alien to us somehow, but it really shouldn't because anybody who's got any um, influence from a Judeo-Christian culture will know that God got very angry with man and flooded the world, killing everybody. And then he instructs Moses to tell everybody, thou shalt not kill. And he does that without even cracking a smile, I guess. Which uh, Yeah, the Old is, Testament God is, is a lot more similar to the Greek gods. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but maybe getting back to the, the relevance of the Odyssey today, um, I think Xenia is... Would, is a valuable lesson in and of itself. I think the gods, I don't know, for me, the gods in the Odyssey also goes to show us what, that we, there's a lot out of our, outside of our control. So, you know, in, and to sort of bring it all together a little bit, um, you're saying about the, the idea of Odysseus, like he kind of constantly, the perseverance to get home and, and do that. And, and I think there's a really valuable lesson tying those all together in that nowadays they say, you know, really big key to success isn't, you, you know, you're not just, you can't just go viral one day or just, you know, magically, you know, get found out. And I mean, this is sort of this sort of fairy tale belief that for some reason we still kind of keep somewhere in the back of our heads like, oh yeah, we're just gonna, this is just gonna magically happen for us. But the, the true path in a way is just, grit is consistency and perseverance and acknowledging mm. that there's a lot of things that are, are outside of our control that are completely not in our realm as if it was just the folly of gods. And, and yes. that what we do have in our control is like Odysseus, the consistent attempt to, to stay focused, to keep going, to in face of adversity, you know, to keep, keep on swimming. Yeah, just, just keep swimming. That's 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 the message, and the the, vi the viral example you give of that we might explode into greatness. I mean, you can also sort of bring in Icarus here. So he explodes in, into into greatness, but then gets a bit too cocky and and then plunges to his death. So so even if you explode in, into greatness, you might you might explode into greatness with Gangnam Style, and then nobody knows who you are after a few years. So be warned. Yeah, yeah. No, no, don't don't attempt to go viral well especially in these days you know <laughs> yeah there we uh, go. pandemic jokes they just don't get old yeah, there we go. It's, <laughs> it's been a long it's been a long lockdown yeah yeah i think i'm like on day 90 or so so to put out my oh, own. yeah I'm, I'm sitting in the former epicenter here in northern italy so i i'm oh you're in the former epicenter i'm in the current epicenter well, isn't that beautiful? It's like passing on the baton. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, I've got the Odyssey to keep me uh, entertained. Well, there we go. Exactly. Best thing to do in a, in a pandemic. Get, well, get, get and the, no, but but in all seriousness, I think that is another good value. Is that one the knowledge that something has just survived that long and can be entertaining and enjoyable and valuable in and of itself, but that you can see, you get a lot of perspective on your own life by reading what's happening mm. to somebody thousands 
of years ago that, 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 that the same human emotions, the same triumphs, the same tragedies, that, that you know, the, the basic human nature is the same and that we want to be with yeah. our families, we want to be with people we love, we're sad when we're away from them, we get scared, we get frightened, you know, that this, there's something humbling in our own lives to know that this is some, we're part of a great human civilization that's yeah, all gone. And, and that's, that's a great um, testament to Homer is that through both, both epics really, the Iliad and the Odyssey, there are very few humans who behave in a way we think, yeah, that, that's not the way to behave. And when they do, they, they really get their comeuppance. So, so good humans are really, are really put up on a pedestal, like um, uh, Eumaeus, um, the, the swineherd who, who takes Odysseus in when he arrives back on Ithaca, is, 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 the, is the golden character of the Odyssey in, in a very peculiar way, because he, he's a downtrodden, he's a, he, he's, he's a servant, he doesn't have a high status in, in the Oikos, um, on the island of Ithaca, but Homer does this strange linguistic thing: is he ad he addresses him in the second person, so it's almost as if Homer is talking to Eumaeus when he's telling us the whole story of the Odyssey, and then he said, "And then you, Eumaeus, you did this," and it's a very peculiar moment where he, they've single he singles out this one person for this personal touch, and it, it's created a lot of. Um, a lot of debate, obviously, about Eumaeus, but it, the only thing it can do is glorify him. It's 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 thought to do. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think in, in our modern way of looking back at, at ancient history, we often are tempted to judge, like, well, now we're so much greater and smarter, yes. and aggressive, and no, oh, aren't we so wonderful? Uh, and those people back there were, I mean, we worship them, but at the same time, we're like, well, we, you know, it's not as good as now. But it, it's interesting to see how often, for instance, women are held up in very high positions and high levels of respect. And like, you know, when, when Odysseus goes to the Phaeacians and, you know, the, the princess um, helps them on uh, the Nausicaa. Now, now Nausicaa, yeah, and she, she's like, she's another one who's like shown very, very positively. And yeah. she's like, you know, don't even, don't even talk to dad, the king. Like everybody worships the queen and her name is Arete. Yeah. And it's like excellence. Like the queen is, is the, is the one to go to. I mean, Penelope is definitely the best character in the book. I mean, even Xerxes, you know, she comes around to being like extremely helpful. And, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the, the baddies the bad female monsters and such like they're still extremely powerful like the you don't have like just men control women you know it's it's not like that yeah it's i mean it's, it's it's a strange um it it makes you very curious about what greek life was like in homer's time and before homer's time because it's it's not nearly as patriarchal as you would imagine and it's definitely not patriarchal like sixth century Athens which is the, the period you obviously know most about where there was a, a great explosion of literature um sixth century BC Athens and and like you say in some ways it, it's, it's quite matriarchal it's whoever marries Penelope will become king of Ithaca it's not that Telemachus this is his son automatically has the right to be king, he's got to come of age first. It's it's all these peculiar, nuanced situations. It's it's when when Helen got abducted in the first place. This was this was a threat to Menelaus's kingship, and like you say, Mausica, perfectly within her rights to see some strange naked man washed up on the shore. She's a princess, so she might just have him sort of taken away in chains, because she's a good. Um, respectful adherent of Xenia, she she gives him advice. She 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 helps him. She clothes him, takes him into the into the palace, and gives tells him what to do with with respect to the queen. And it does help that apparently Odysseus is like hot, you know. What I mean, and she's like a young princess. <laughs> <laughs> she's totally fancy. I mean, it's pretty clear she's got her eyes yeah. on him. Yeah. You think like a couple of days before there'd be someone else washed up on the shore? She goes. 
yeah. yeah. He doesn't have he doesn't have a washboard abs or anything. No. Um, and but I, also, I'm glad think, you went for abs. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the other thing is, is that, uh, like the men are much more in touch with their emotions. Like Odysseus cries a lot. Always cries. And, Always and, cries. Like this, the one time, for instance, when he's like the bard is singing about Odysseus and he's crying tears that is then described to be the same as a woman who is crying over her dead husband as she's being pulled away to slavery. And you're like, could, you can't cry more than that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, your husband just died. You're about to become a slave. Who knows what's going to happen to you? Like, that is the level of crying that's that he's doing. Cry. Well, just listening to a poet. That he, I mean, he's crying to singing and poetry. And you're like, you know, how so, yeah, so this, this is when feeling? He's listening. He's listening to to Demodocus in the um, in the in the in the in the court of Arete and, and Alcinous. Yes. He's, yeah, and, but he's always crying. He's crying. I think the first time we see him on the on the shore of Calypso's island, he's crying there. He's just yep. he's constantly blubbing. And I mean, obviously, there's I don't know anything in in the ancient literatures. I, I'm, I could well be wrong, but I don't remember reading things about anybody saying, "Oh, what what a pansy! Why is he always crying?" It's it's, yeah, it's I mean, much more. Yeah. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he does say to his to his crew, like, "All right, stop your crying. I know everybody's dead, but let's move on." Yeah, <laughs> stop your crying. We're gonna need. We're gonna need to. We're gonna be stopping a lot when I'm crying. So you guys, we can't. We can't all do this. Yeah, yeah. who's the captain? Only the captain cries. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's a hero quality crying. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Well, I, 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 well, there is this interesting argument about. Um, the quality of Odysseus as a hero, because there are so many things to talk about. And you talk about the strong female characters, and we've got this, Odysseus is, a, is a, in so many ways a weak, heroic character. And this is not for the crying in particular, but this is for being a lousy soldier. And because that's what he's supposed to be, he's supposed to be a soldier. And if we think about what is a hero, and we base it on what we see in the Iliad, in the Iliad, a hero is as close to Achilles, or you could argue as close to Hector, as you can get. You're proud, you're strong, you're noble, you're, you defend your family, you defend your kingdom. You don't accept insults. You won't let anybody insult your honor. That's why um, Achilles goes on strike. Um, but Odysseus, this is not, the blueprint of Odysseus. He's not somebody who's charging into battle. He would much rather win by sneakiness. And and he's always doing and he's keeps getting his men killed for no reason. I know. Like he's taunting the Cyclops and like his men are begging him to stop taunting. They're like, <laughs> what are you doing? And he's like, nah, 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 nah. like, dude, the guy just threw a rock at us. He I mean, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Leave him alone. <laughs> Let the poor guy be. And it's not just that he's, he won't listen to his men, his men won't listen to him either, because they're, they're within, within touching distance, they can see Ithaca in the distance, at, right at the beginning of their journeys, and they've got the bag of winds, and he's told his men, whatever you do, don't open the bag of winds that he's been given um, by, by the god. And they open the bag, and they get blown all off course, and they start all over again. He's a poor leader, and... He's he's appetitive. He can't res he can't say no to his emotions, whether that's food or sex or lying or stealing. He's he's got he's got all these vices that would obviously not welcome in society. But he's he's still the great hero. And there's there's a lot of debate over whether is he a hero in spite of his vices or is he the blueprint for a hero. Is this what a real Homeric hero is? Is that whatever he does, he's the hero. That's what a hero does. And it's a bit like sort of papal, um, uh, what do you call it? Papal, um, not, not perfection. Uh, when the Pope can never be wrong. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So it's, um, <laughs> so whatever a does is what a hero is.
Um, so that, that's the other side of that argument, which I doesn't really, I never really swallowed that, that argument so much. I, I see more as a flawed, a deeply flawed hero rather than. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it's, it's, people love to have a hero that's relatable. Like in some ways, it's kind of boring having somebody be perfect. And I mean, as mm -hmm. regards to just storytelling goes, it's more interesting seeing somebody that you can relate to that struggles with anger and competitiveness and vices. Like, I mean, isn't that what most mortals deal with? But it, it is interesting though, because I mean, Odysseus is depicted differently by different myths too. And, and I mean, the Homeric version, he's kind of a lovable scoundrel, but you and I both very well know the play Philectetes uh in, in which uh maybe our listeners don't know is where we met you know a couple of decades ago almost. A decades ago, yeah. <laughs> not quite that old wait um yeah mm -hmm. 2003 i think yeah that uh odysseus is he's not a lovable scoundrel in that oh he's no he's a, he's a scumbag right scumbag He's sleazy, he's horrible, he's manipulative. He's not just manipulative towards um, um, Philoctetes, he's manip manipulative towards Neoptolemus. He's sort of corrupting an innocent young soul in the play as well. And it's only the goodness of Neoptolemus that's, that um, stops it from being the worst case scenario. So it's, you know, he's, he's, he's real, a real scumbag in that play. So it's, it's interesting that if you were to take those versions into account, then you really have to question why he's a hero because the Homeric one, I mean, you can kind of see it. Mm. But yeah, like his, his, but mistake, right. his mistakes in, I guess the thing is in, in Homer, you feel like his mistakes are, are human, like they're out of passion, you know, like, mm. you know, if you get angry, okay, yeah, you, you shouldn't get angry, but it's not, but in, in Flectitudes, he's, he's like conniving and like a, in moral yeah. way. And the thing is, the, the one caveat you can give him in the Odyssey is that what a Greek hero craves more, what a Homeric hero craves more than anything is, is kleos, which is um, what people say about you. So it's, it's sort of reputation, but it, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's sort of, it, it's, it, it goes really deep into the soul, but we don't, we probably won't get too sidetracked on Kleos, but it's more or less your reputation is Kleos. And there is this argument that all the stupid things he does, all the capricious things he does, they're all about trying to enhance his Kleos, trying to enhance his reputation. Because it takes him 10 years to get home, but he spends eight of those years on desert islands having sex with beautiful goddesses. The suitors, have only arrived three years before the end of the story. So there's been a 10 years of the Trojan War, seven years Odysseus has been away, and then the suitors arrive. So if he just cut his, um, you know, divine bordello time down to five years, he could have still got back before the suitors started you know, laying siege to his house. But if he just got back and said, oh, hi, honey, sorry I'm late, then that's not a, there's no reputation building story there. But to get back and, and slaughter 108 people, that gives you a bit more of a reputation boost. So there's all these ideas. The same with the Cyclops. The reason he taunts at the end is because otherwise the Cyclops won't know his name and won't tell the people, you know what Odysseus did, this jerk? He'll just say, do you know what no one did? Yeah, yeah, and that just wouldn't be satisfying enough, would it? <laughs> so he needs people to, he needs his name to be out there. He's like so he's some, some uh, media hungry, crazy. He's like an influencer or something, like an Instagram, <laughs> the ancient world. Like, <laughs> did everyone see how hot I was? That goddess really wanted me. Yeah, it's Odysseus Kardashian, that's what we got. <laughs> So I guess that tells you that uh, what people want out of celebrities has not changed. <laughs> no, no, we, we, we like it when they're high, but we like it just as much when they're low. Yeah, and we certainly 
don't want them to be perfect. And we don't want them to be perfect, indeed. That is a key key point to probably to his enduring popularity, I think, is how, how imperfect he is. Classical Wisdom members can listen to the whole podcast on classicalwisdom.com. Thank you for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks.